Go. Okay. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so today we're going to start with looking at the protocol, how to do restriction enzyme cloning. And we're going to walk you through the step-by-step -step process and then explain to you the rationale for each of the steps. And then that should give you further insights moving forward. Okay, so we'll start. We already talked about this in the lab a little bit. I'm just going to briefly review the concepts of the primer design. Okay. So the first thing to do when you get designing your primers is to know the sequence of your template. So your target. Okay. And we talked about how you can go to NCBI and you can download the FASTA format, FASTA format of your gene, which gives you a little carrot with the name and then uh, return. And then it'll give you your sequence, ATG, XYZ. I'll start with the start codon. Okay. So you lay out your sequence of your gene in a Word file. Okay. Once you got that, you got everything you need. And if you needed to clone, let's say if you didn't want to design your primers here or here, if you wanted more sequence upstream, one reason you might want to do that is if you wanted to clone the endogenous promoter. That means the natural promoter of gene X. If you want to do that, all you'd have to do is download an extra plus maybe 500, or maybe you want 1,000, or maybe you want 1,500 extra base pairs, five prime upstream of that start codon. Does that make sense? So if you wanted to get that endogenous promoter, you could just grab that extra sequence from NCBI. Okay? And if you wanted to clone the endogenous terminator, same thing. You could just get more sequence, what's called downstream from NCBI. Is it worth me showing you like how you would do that? Wait, is this just the same? You just go back to the same. So what you can do is so you go to the website and on the website, when you click on that, when you click on that thing, that FASTA, you click on that, on the top right hand of your screen, there'll be a little box that says start. And, and in these boxes, it will give you a number, say five, one, six, two, four, three. And that's the base pair of the genome. So if your genome, if you have a genome for a bacteria, it's gonna start at base pair one and end at base pair, whatever, 1,250,000, so right? Essentially mile marker. Exactly, it's a mile marker. And so all you have to do to get that to get upstream is you would decrease this. You decrease that number to move left. Does that make sense? And then you can, there's a little button that says like, is something like, re, uh, not review, but like, like, like give me, give me, if you edit these numbers, you can hit like go and it will change the, what you're, what you're being shown. So if you wanted the terminator, whatever this number was down here, you would increase that to move forward beyond the end of the gene. Yeah. So that's how you would get those sequences. And sometimes you do. Sometimes you want to design a little a primer upstream. Or maybe this sequence gives you is you you just know the primer is not going to work because there's so many hairpins and you're in like a repeat region. So maybe you need to look for a better primer upstream. Sometimes that's that's common. So those are some of the things you need to consider when designing a primer. And then we talked about when you design a primer, you'll take the sequence. So your forward primer is exactly sense DNA. Okay, so that means you're literally taking that sequence, copy and pasting it for your forward primer. Okay, but your reverse primer is not is not sense. Okay, so what you would do to get your reverse primer is you map out the sequence you want. You make sure that those, the annealing temperature is good, and you can check that at that website, OligoCalc. It'll give you that salt adjusted, salt adjusted annealing temperature, right? And then once you got that, once you got a primer that you think is good, 
you have to take the reverse complement. And you can just take that at that reverse complement website. And then that is going to give you listed five prime to three prime, the sequence of your reverse primer. So you would order this and you would order this. Does that make sense? Yeah. So every gene you put into a plasmid before you have four is kind of reverse primer? Yes. Because think about how PCR works. So if you are going to clone this gene, are you going to be able to amplify uh, a double-stranded thing of DNA if you're just always running this way? Does that make sense? So DNA has direction. The polymerase can only read and write in that one direction. So if you only put one primer, your polymerase can only go that one way. And you're just going to produce a bunch of molecules that are all five to three, but it won't be double-stranded DNA. So to make the double-stranded, to make the double-stranded DNA, you got to denature. So let me erase these to give myself more room. The way that PCR works, and this is in the reading, you denature these strands, okay, and your primer. So when you when you pick a primer that matches, so well here I drew it wrong. When you pick a primer that matches this sequence exactly, that means your forward primer is annealing down here, and your polymerase is writing here. Your reverse primer, you got from this, and you took the reverse complement, which is this. So now your reverse primer is annealing up here, and then your polymerase is writing like this. And now you have two molecules. Molecule one, two. Does that make sense? And then that's how you produce that exponential curve of amplicons by looping the steps. Back and back and back. Does that make sense? That's why you need two primers for PCR. Now, let's let's relate this to what we also talked about with Sanger sequencing. Sanger sequencing, you only need one primer, and that's because you're not you're not amplifying the amplicon. All you're doing is you want the sequence. So all you're doing is you're having that polymerase write that one time, and then it it, it will write a bunch of those at different sizes, okay? But you don't want to mix in, the reason you put one primer is you don't want to have in that reaction mixed in a bunch of things going the other way because that's not, you're not going to be able to sequence that. Does that make sense? Your, your chromatograph would give you conflicting signals. So you only have one primer in the Sanger sequencing reaction and you have two primers in PCR. Okay. Um, okay, we you already know this for sure now, the CG clamp, because the CGs have three hydrogen bonds. You always try to start and end with that CG clamp on your primers. So you want to do the CG over here, CG over here. Which is the one you care about less? This end or this end? The CG clamp is more important on one end. Do you know why? And which one? The three prime. The three prime. Right. Why? Because this is the one that gets written off of. So this one, even you you want that, you want the CG clamp there, but even if this is a A or a T and it's a little floppy, as long as it's tight here, that polymerase will be able to find it and write. Okay, and if you go back to your PCR template and you look at these primers, this is what this is. If this is your primer, this is five, three. So you want that one tight. And up here, this is five, three. So you want that one tight. So really, where it really, really matters is on the three prime end. And if you look at and understand how PCR works, this is why because it relates back to you want it really tight where that polymerase starts writing. Okay. Um, so step one of cloning a gene is just 
designing your primers. We got that good enough. We're good. Okay. Um, let's talk about some other considerations with primers. So let me propose a scenario. You want to clone GeneX into plasmid A. Okay. And let me ask you a question. You can only find one restriction enzyme that works. Restriction enzyme C. Is it going to work? Will it work? To So here would be your backbone. And it has C right here. And here is your amplicon. Let's say you design primers that added in C on the ends. Now my question is, is this gonna work? Can you clone that in with one restriction enzyme? No. Really, it won't work? You're still gonna, so let's, let's say you do their digest. You're still gonna get a sticky end here. You're still gonna get a sticky end here. It's gonna cut here, and it's gonna leave you with sticky on this side and sticky on this side. So let me ask again, will it work? It'll work, but you're going to have some problems. Let me talk about the problems because sometimes, and the reason I'm talking about this is because sometimes you can only find one restriction enzyme to use. So don't have your mind say, oh, I can't do it because Dr. Beckman said we can always have to have two. No, you can always, there's always breaks to the rules. So, but let me explain the problems that you're going to encounter and then you'll understand how to fix those problems. So here's what, here's what will happen is you'll get your sticky ends, see here, see here. And you'll get your sticky ends, matching C here, matching C here, okay? And it'll anneal in, five prime, three prime. And that's gonna be 50% of your, of your annealing product. The other product is gonna be, so if it's going this way, the other product is gonna be the exact same thing, but reversed, right? You're gonna have it going in this way, five prime, three prime because you got those same sites on both ends. Does that make sense? And the restriction enzymes are palindromes, same forwards as backwards. So this is gonna go in in both directions. So 50% of your clones are gonna be in the right direction. 50% of your clones are gonna be in the wrong direction if this is your promoter, okay? So you've decreased your efficiency by 50%. If you're still really good, if you still if you're really good at cloning and you get for every time you do a cloning reaction, you pick three colonies and usually one out of three has it. That's still OK, because all you got to do now is pick six clones and then sequence and two out of the six. And out of those two, one of those should be right, according to the mathematics. Right. So it can still work. Um, but the way that you figure this out is then you would have to pick all the colonies and then you would have to sequence with the primer on your plasmid going in. Okay, and you would be able to tell from that sequence if it was in the right direction or the wrong direction. So what you would see is if if you did the sequencing reaction, you'd get back the FASTA file. Okay, and you'd have green is sequence of your plasmid. So you would see the promoter region, right? Because I told you we have a primer here sequencing in from the promoter. So you'd see the sequence of your promoter in the right direction. And then if your clone was in the right direction, you'd see A, T, G. If your clone was in the wrong direction, you would see, so this is right. Yeah, you'd see it backwards. You'd see the stop codon, but it would be in reverse. So if it, if it would be, if it would be, it'd look like this. It'd be the match to this. So it'd be C, T, uh, A. You'd see C, T, A. Does that make sense? Okay. So. That still works. It still it would still work if you can only if you only have one enzyme, you can still get it to work, but it's harder. Now there's another problem. That's one problem. The one problem is it can flip the direction. So if you want to clone with direction guaranteed, you have to have two restriction enzymes where they're different. You put A and C on one side, and then you know for a fact it's going to clone in the right direction because then those sticky ends can only match in that direction. Okay. The other problem you're going to get, what's another problem? 
if you have C, 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 C. What's another problem? Yeah, this matches this, and this matches this. So now, what's the most common product? If you think in basic chemistry and entropy, is it more likely for an experiment with two molecules to happen or one molecule to happen? It's much, what? Like two. No, it's a lot more simple. It's a lot easier. So what happens if, if this, for, for this reaction, For this reaction to happen, two molecules, this one and this one, have to find each other in a diffusing solution. The other alternative is the end of that molecule finds the end of that molecule. Yeah, so it's a lot easier. It's a lot easier for what this is called, is called self ligation. So when you do that ligation reaction, now you're literally just sealing the backbone of the plasmid, and you're also, what you could have happen is you could have your PCR amplicon circularize. Circularize. Because this C matches this, and all of a sudden now you have a circle, okay? And these are gonna be far more common than your insertion of gene X, if you're only using one restriction enzyme, okay? So that's the other problem, is circularization is problem two. Okay, so I told you you can fix the first problem by just picking more colonies and just making sure to sequence, okay? How do you fix the second problem? There is an enzyme called CYP, which is calf, is it inositol or is it calf intestinal? Intest so they purify this from calf intestines, Intest intestinal phosphatase, okay? And you can buy this, whatever I'm spelling on. You can buy this from New England Biolabs, which sells enzymes, or any enzyme company. And what this enzyme does is, if you're worried about this thing sealing on itself, okay, it can only seal itself in the ligation reaction if there is a, a phosphate backbone there. It can, only, it can only fuse if there's a phosphate there. What SIP does is it removes the phosphates. So it can no longer seal itself. So what you do is if you want to fix this problem, you have two products, right? You have your amplicon, which has C and C, and you have your plasmid, which has C and C, and you treat just one of these, just one, one with SIP, okay? You treat you usually treat your plasmid. So when you do your restriction enzyme digest, you usually just will add plus one microliter of SIP. Okay? And that means after that thing gets cut, SIP is going to remove those phosphates so it can't seal with each other, can't seal with itself. This thing, your amplicon, should still have the phosphates. Okay. So then when this thing gets added in. Now the only reaction that can happen with the ligation or the, well, this thing could in theory still circularize, but a lot of times this is tiny and it's harder for a tiny thing to bend back on itself. So usually what happens is now more commonly you've selected for this insertion to happen and now it can be sealed with ligase because those phosphates are back there, okay? So this is how you solve the problem if you can only use one restriction enzyme. Okay, and this is actually a very, very, very common problem because what you're going to run into is you want to clone Gene X. You look at Gene X's sequence, your multi cloning site in your vector only has, let's say, 10 enzymes. You got a list of 10 enzymes in X order, and maybe all nine, all nine of those are in your gene. That means you can't use all nine of those. Maybe there's only one left that you can use, one. So that's just the one you gotta use if you're gonna do it. And then you gotta do it with the SIP, okay? The what? only thing you could do if like, all of the multi cloning sites are in your gene? Yes, uh, you don't do restriction enzyme cloning. You do a different kind of cloning, which is what we're gonna talk about next time. Um, so yes, 
there is there are other ways to clone. I think I talked about this. There is restriction enzyme cloning. There is um, there's a type of cloning. I call it Gibson. That's a common name for it. But it's based off PCR. It's also like sewing. It's based off basically PCR and homology regions. And then there's a form of cloning which is called the recombinering, which is where you're literally just using recombin recombination enzymes to recombine things in. So yes, if restriction enzyme cloning doesn't work, you can try this or this or synthesize, right? So there's other ways to get around this. Um, but sometimes, sometimes, yeah, if so, if there are no restriction enzyme sites that you can use, then you got to do it a different way. And that is, that's, this is a good segue into the next lecture. That is the limitation. That's the limitation of restriction enzyme cloning is it's, you, you need these specific sequences in your gene that match and things need to be compatible. And that's a massive limitation that you will encounter once you start really, really cloning stuff a lot. Okay. <clears throat> so let's just review what goes into the PCR reaction. So the first step I said in cloning a gene is designing your primers designing your primers. And then the second step is PCR of your amplicon. Okay, so what goes into this PCR reaction? Your primers, there's two of them. Your DNA template, your buffer, water, DNTPs, and there's one more thing. The thing we always add last, and sometimes we don't even add it until it's hot. Mm -hmm. Fusion or high fidelity polymerase. Polymerase. Okay. And this is, if you see other protocols, this is what, that's TAC, right? TAC is a polymerase. It's just a low fidelity polymerase. Okay, good. You guys know that. So you guys know everything that goes in PCR reaction. Okay. So we can, we can move beyond that. So that second step is you actually have to PCR your amplicon. So the goal is what you're doing is you're trying to make millions and millions and millions and millions of copies of the thing you want to insert. And basically what you do is you eventually just mix a tube of as many copies as you can make of your gene X with as few copies of your plasmid. And then you really, really select for this insertion to happen. Does that make sense? Because if there's a lot of these, it's really likely that they're going to be able to find their way in a diffusing solution of chemicals uh, to do that insert. So PCR is this process by which we make millions and millions of copies of those amplicons. Um, okay, let's ask, let's ask another question. Um, so let's say you got gene X, Y, and Z. This one is 500 base pairs, this one is 10,000 base pairs. Which is going to be easiest to clone? This one. Oh, easy. That's easy. This one? That's still fine. That's still easy. Up to, up to 5,000 is easy. You can hit that. Greater than or equal to 5,000 base pairs starts to get really hard. Okay. Um, 10,000 base pair cloning, that starts to get really hard. And why? You're starting, you're, you're asking that polymerase to amplify a sequence that's so long. And sometimes stuff happens. Sometimes the polymerase just falls off. And sometimes it doesn't go that far. Okay. So, and it's also is time sensitive, right? Like we talked about how the polymerase can only add a certain amount of base pairs per second. So your extension step here is going to be... 10 times 15 seconds, 150 seconds. How many minutes is that? Like what, a little bit more than two, it's like two and a half minutes, something like that, two and a half minutes. So that means every time you loop, your extension step is two and a half minutes. That means every time you're doing that, your polymerase is sitting in hot temperature. Some of that polymerase is gonna be degrading, okay? So the longer your extension step, basically the less efficient your 
extension is going to become. So it's harder and harder and harder to amplify longer and longer and longer things. And there's actually like, you, you, you literally just can't do things that are more than 10,000. So at this point, if you got something, if you got something you want to clone, this is another reason you need to switch protocols is if you got something to clone that's greater than 10,000 base pairs, you probably are not going to be able to clone that unless you do recombination. Okay. So these are things, again, you're considering. That's why I talked in the last lecture about considering like the size of the thing you're trying to do. Okay. So step one was primers. Step two was PCR. Step three. Okay. Now we got our tube. We got our amplicons in that tube. But we talked about the reagents that are in there. There's also the polymerase, there's a DMTPs, there's a buffer. All that stuff is still left over in that tube. And most of the time, we want to do what's called a purification. So this would be a PCR purification to get rid of all this stuff that we don't need anymore. Okay? We just want the DNA. We just want the amplicon. So we do a PCR purification. That's what step three is, amplicon PCR purification, okay? And you'll buy a kit for this. You just buy a little box. It'll come in a box uh, and it'll have a little protocol on a sheet that you read. And basically what you're doing is you'll get a tube and it'll be a tube within a tube, okay? And this tube will have a column. It'll be a mini column. And in that tube will be a substance that binds DNA, okay? So I'm explaining this to you so you understand when you do these kits, you actually know what's happening, okay? So in that tube, within a tube, you will take your PCR amplicon and put that in there, okay? And then you'll centrifuge it down, drip, 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 drip. And all your stuff that you don't want, your polymerase, your DNTPs, your buffer, will pass through. But this column substance binds DNA. So your amplicon will stick to that, right? stick to that okay and then at the final end of that kit there's an elution step which was what again you explained it well avery um uh, something that has greater affinity for the solid state for the, for the part that ends up right and most of the time that's just water because water right dna is negative phosphate backbone right and water um wait these are plus right Right, so it'd be flipped. So water is very, very good at uh, pulling DNA away from things in solution because it has this polarity with its hydrogen. Okay, so oftentimes the elution you're just adding water, which washes away your uh, elution of your DNA. Okay, so then that gets uh, eluted into a new tube. Now you got a new tube of pure amplicon. Okay, we're not done yet. Now we are ready for step four, the restriction enzyme digest. Okay, let's talk about this and talk about actually what's happening. So we need to take, we need to make a new mixture. A new, this is a reaction in a tube. So in that new tube, we need to add our one amplicon what else do you think we're gonna to need to add to this reaction? Right, our enzymes. And usually there's gonna be not one, but two enzymes. So usually we have to add plus enzyme one, plus enzyme two. Now, let me ask a question. Enzymes are what, what kind of molecule? There's nucleic acids, proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, they're proteins, they're proteins, and they're not the same. These are different proteins. So they're gonna have different amino acid sequences, different foldings. So let me ask another question. Are they gonna like the same thing or different things? No. Yeah, usually they're gonna like different things because they're completely two different entities. So that's kind of a problem because we wanna do a digest of our amplicon. Oh, make that mistake. We want to do a digest of our amplicon with two different restriction enzymes, and we want to do it at the same time. How do we do that? Well, let me show you. Let's bring up Google here. 
So the company you buy your enzymes from I set that as my homepage. <laughs> uh, I do this to tease my students. Um, okay, so let's do New England Biolabs double digest. So New England Biolabs is a company that engineers enzymes that people buy. And New England Biolabs has been doing this for a long time. And they have, this is not the one I want. They have engineered their enzymes to be compatible with each other. But let me just show you. Um, I gotta find the right site. And there's a lot, there's a lot to learn here. If I can double digest finder. So you, you're gonna find on New England Biolabs, there's this double digest finder, okay? So we wanna figure out, let's say, let's say we picked, here's another problem that you'll often run into, is you got a plasmid and you got a multi-cloning site and you picked A and B enzymes and they match perfectly. They're the ones you wanna use to clone in your gene. And then you go to check the double digest and A is not compatible with B. So this is another compatibility issue that you need to check. So let's say we picked two common enzymes. I th let's pick BAMH1 and XHO1. So let's say this one was here on five prime and this one was here on three prime. We need to check to see if these are compatible with each other. And if they are, what buffer are we gonna mix them in to make the reaction work? Okay, so let's here select enzyme. Let's put JO1. And we're actually going to do, you should be able to find, uh, there's a high fidelity version. Well, for now, I'll just put Joe one. Let's find BAM H1 here. There's BAM H1, high fidelity. Okay. And it already calculated it for us. So there's a couple things to look at here. So name of the enzyme, Joe one BAM H1. It's telling you the catalog number, the temperature. When we do these restriction digests, we need to do it at a right temperature, okay? So it's telling you the temperature they like and they're compatible. So that's one thing you need to check is are the temperatures the same? Yes, they're the same, okay? Now look at these. New England Biolabs gives you four different buffers because certain enzymes are only compatible in certain buffers, okay? So these are different mixtures, 1.1, 2.1, 3.1, and CutSmart, okay? And this is telling you that Joe one is only 75% active in 1.1 buffer, but BAMH1 is 100% active. So obviously 1.1 buffer is not what you're gonna use to do the restriction enzyme, because one of your enzymes is not 100% active in that buffer. Same thing here, 2.1. This one's only 50% active in 2.1. This one's only 10% active in 3.1. But look where they match perfectly in this cut smart buffer. So you guys are coming at a time where when I started, they hadn't engineered these high fidelity enzymes. Um, and we had to match buffers perfectly to make sure. And sometimes we had to pick which was the best of whatever, the best choice we could make. Now New England Biolabs has spent time re-engineering all their enzymes into high fidelity versions, which are all 100% compatible in a cut smart buffer. So they've actually like engineered their enzymes to work all in the same buffer. So you guys probably don't have to deal with this if your people are buying, if your PIs are buying high fidelity enzymes. But you always wanna check this because another thing that can vary is the temperature. So you check your double digest to make sure that here the buffer you're gonna wanna use is telling you it's the cut smart buffer, okay? So let's go back to the notes. So here in this reaction, the other thing we're gonna add is the cut smart buffer, okay? And then we're gonna add water to make it up to, up to a certain volume. Let's say we set 50 microliters as our final volume, okay? But we're not done yet. There's two, actually two restriction digests that have to happen, right? What are the two restriction digests? We just talked about the amplicon, which has to get cut here and here. What's the other thing that needs to get cut? 
the backbone, right? So here's the backbone and it's got site A and site C, okay? And this thing needs to get cut too. And we don't wanna mix these together yet. We're not, we're not ready to mix them. So you need to set up two separate tubes, tube one with Amplicon, tube two with the backbone. Okay, and then you're cutting these. Okay, here's another problem. When you cut this, in this tube, you're gonna have, this is gonna yield two products. It's gonna yield these two products. Now let me ask a question. Can this reseal that? Yeah, it matches perfectly. So we need to do something to get rid of this. We need to get rid of that, okay? So how do you think is a way that we can get rid of that? And that's gonna be the next step is step five, which is gel purification, okay? So we make an agarose gel. There's a couple things we need to get rid of. We need to get rid of this extra tiny uh, cutout so that our plasmid backbone doesn't reseal with itself. And we also need to get rid of, now, we need, now we're done with the enzymes. We need to get rid of them. Get rid of the enzymes, we need to get rid of that buffer. We need to get rid of everything we don't want except the DNA. So we make a gel, it's got our little wells. Okay, and you will load this into the gel and you also load your Amplicon into the gel, the Amplicon that you digested, because the Amplicon also has enzymes that we need to get rid of and buffer that we need to get rid of. So you load those into the gel, different lanes. And that's why I said in one lane, you'll put a ladder and then you'll run this, okay? And let's ask what's gonna happen. So in these wells is gonna be your enzymes, your buffer and your DNA. And then when you turn on that electric current, what's the only thing that's gonna run into the gel? The DNA, it's the only thing that's gonna run into the gel. So you're gonna get nice bands for your Amplicon and a nice band for your plasmid. And you'll probably see a little tiny thing right here, which is that, right? But now you've separated them. You can actually visually see them, okay? So then what you do is you cut this out with a little razor and you cut this out with a little razor and this thing goes into one tube and this thing goes into another tube, okay? And now what you have in these tubes are digested, purified DNA, backbone. Here you have digested amplicon DNA plus now you've added, you, you were able to get rid of your enzymes and your buffer and this little tiny thing, but now there's something else that's in there. What else is in there? Agarose. agarose plus agarose. So now you need to do another purification to get rid of your agarose because you can't ligate something that's in uh, gel, okay? So if step five was gel purification, step six is a kit gel purification, okay? So you'll buy a kit for this, it come in a little box, just like before, give you a little protocol, you follow the protocol, and what's happening is now in that thing where you got your cutout gel, you heat that, so you add some heat, the agarose will melt, you'll add some chemical buffers, and then you do the same thing, it's a tube within a tube, tube, within a tube, and then you mix this melted solution into here, same thing, column that binds your DNA, everything else passes through. So this purifies out and gets rid of the agarose, okay? So now when you elute with your water, you'll have two tubes of your amplicon, which is now digested with sticky ends, and your backbone, pure, no agarose. Now these are ready for 
the final, well, not the final step, but one of the final steps in assembly, which is ligation. Okay, so now you're ready for step six, which is ligation. So now, only now, is when you are ready to take these things and mix them together in one tube. And what you're going to do, let me ask you a question. So you have amplicon and backbone. Which of these do you want more of? You want much, much, much more amplicon. You want a much higher concentration of amplicon. So I'll usually put like 16 to 1 ratio in just terms of volume. I usually put 16 microliters and 1 microliter in here. Okay. So those are two reagents is amplicon, backbone. What else goes into this? Ligase. Ligase, T4 ligase, which seals the phosphate backbone. What else goes in it? Ligase is an enzyme, so it wants a, a buffer. And in that buffer is ATP because ligase requires ATP. Okay. Then you mix that. Now you've sealed your little gene into your site, into your plasma. And let's say you got millions of these. Okay. Still not done yet, but we're getting there. Step seven. At this point, you could freeze this, but it's not going to last forever. Okay. So you want to get this into a bacteria where it can last almost forever. So the next step is called transformation. So that's where you take what's called a competent. That means you already treated it with the chemicals to make it ready to absorb DNA. It's chemically competent bacteria. Okay. So you have a tube full of these bacteria that you grew and you treated, you made them competent, they're ready, they're ready to take up DNA. And you take and you add to this transformation plus your ligated plasmid. You add your ligated plasmid. And what happens in this process is you already treated them with the chemical. And now all you need to do is heat shock, heat shock, which scares the bacteria. And they open up their pores. And now your DNA plasmid goes inside. So this is like a zoom in of what's happening in a microscopic, microscopic scale down there. Okay, so now you've transformed your bacteria. Not done yet. Step eight, actually this is a subset part of transformation. Now you need to plate your bacteria because now you need to, what's this process called? Select, right? How do we know what to select for? There's a cassette on our plasma, whatever it was, if it was AMP, or if it was canamycin, or if it was chloramphenicol. We make media plates that have these chemicals in there, which will kill the bacteria unless they keep the plasma. And then little things will grow, which are called colonies. Okay, so we've transformed. Now what we do, pick. The colonies so we take a little toothpick we poke it and then we put it in liquid culture of let's say it's amp lb amp okay and then the only thing that can grow are our bacteria in the liquid culture that have our plasmid and then we come back the next day and now we have a thriving culture of billions of bacteria, and each one of those billions has 600 copies of our plasma gene X, if we did high copy plasma, right? And then we can freeze that, minus 80. That's probably worth talking about a little bit. We can finish here on this. How do you freeze that? Um, for storage, right? So. What happens if you take an organism and you freeze it and it's in water? What actually happens? Uh, crystals yeah, crystal. What happens to ice? What happens to the volume of ice? Expands. It expands. So what happens if you have an organism in water and you freeze it? It will expand and it will crush the bacteria. So if you just do this, most of your bacteria will die. Okay? So what we do is we add a chemical 
glycerol, okay? So this is called a glycerol stock. And what, yeah, glycerol disrupts crystal ice formation, okay? And it also incorporates into the bacterial membrane. So when you add glycerol, it will incorporate into the bacterial's membrane. Now you can freeze. So if you have a stock that's like, most people make stocks 30 to 50% glycerol. And if you have a stock, a tube of bacteria plus, plus glycerol, now you can freeze that and the ice crystals are not so damaging because they're disrupted by the glycerol. You can't, they can't get the perfect lattice, okay? If you, if you study chemistry, um, I don't know, it's something like this, right? Like a, a water crystal lattice is something like this and it forms a perfect, that's why it can crystallize into an ice. But if you have other reagents in there, like, like glycerol that disrupts this, it can't form that lattice and so it's not, it's not um, damaging the bacteria. But you can still cool it to minus 80, which, what's the reason? What's the reason that we cool things to minus 80? Things will degrade in the freezer very, very slow. So. Right, why do they degrade slow in the freezer? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mostly because uh, what, what, well, if, if there's, I guess there's two forms of degradation. One form of degradation, which is much, much slower, is like chemicals like falling apart. Like actually like covalent bonds, I guess, like breaking apart. That's much, we actually are not worrying about that as much. Okay, what we're worrying about more are actual like live enzymes. This is a living organism that has proteases. What do proteases do? They cut, they cut proteins. They have DNases that cut DNA. They have RNases that cut RNA. So we worry much, much more about these live enzymes. And when you cool something to minus 80, you stop all functionality of these enzymes. Now that, I'm saying that with like a grain of salt, like some enzymes can still run at minus 80. But, um, for the most part, everything is dead. Well, not dead, but everything stops at minus 80. And now you got a culture that can last for thousands of years. So maybe you will make a clone and a thousand years later, somebody will pull it out from a freezer and use it. Maybe. Um, we don't have enough time to talk. The last step is then is verification. We've talked a little bit about this and I've shown you a little bit about the data of how you would do it. Eventually I wanna show you really how to reconstruct. Let me just finish, let me, let me finish with this, with a problem that you often encounter with verification. So we talked about Sanger sequencing that we use. We wanna sequence gene X. So let's say we Sanger sequence with one primer and the primer only goes this far. That's not enough. We need to sequence the entire gene. So often what you need to do is you need to make multiple primers that span the region, and sometimes you want them going in both directions, okay? And then when we Sanger sequence these, we hopefully get overlapping reads that we can then assemble based on where they match, and we can assemble the whole length of our gene to check the sequence. Because what commonly happens is, let's say you clone gene X, and you only sequence here, you test your plasma and it doesn't work. Well, then you sequence it later and you find out the polymerase mutated it and there was a premature stop codon or something like that. So I think I have written on here, don't ever work with something that, don't ever spend your time working on a construct that you haven't fully sequenced. Because imagine spending two years studying something and then you sequence it as a last step before you publish your paper and you find out there's a mutation in your gene. And now you worry that everything you just discovered is only because of that incorrect error, right? You don't wanna do that. So you usually wanna sequence everything right away. Um, I'll just say one other final note since I have time here. A lot of times what you do is you'll buy genes for, or you'll buy plasmas from Adgene. I showed you that website. Or you'll send, maybe somebody made a plasmid 
and you have a use for it. So you send that person an email and you say, can you send me that plasma? And they can send you bacteria. And that it's very, very, very common. Okay. But when they send you that, don't trust that they send you the right tube. Okay. Because what they do is they tell their graduate students, go pull this thing out of the freezer and send it to this guy. And what's the likelihood that that graduate student got that right and sent you the right thing? It's not a hundred percent. And yeah, it's actually very low. So like you should check everything that they send you by sequencing so that you know what you're working with. So don't make conclusions about constructs. You're not hundred percent certain what they are. And I will end with that. Next time we talk about ways to engineer, you've already built your plasma. Now you want to insert maybe like a tag or you want to manipulate a sequence, change up, make a mutation or something like that. We'll talk about that next time. Thank you.